This is a panel for women by women. What kinds of compromises are women typically asked to make on their way to success? One of them are friendships and the amount of time that you have to spend with your friends. I think you also have experienced that. And this year I actually came up with something really good. A lot of times women want to talk to me about business, so now my friends are becoming goal friends. So I'm taking a little bit of what I have to do and I'm bringing that into my meetings with them so I'm getting a little bit of work done and a little bit of fun at the same time and it's also helping them out because they're always wanting to do something, but instead of just lunch we're accomplishing something. I think a lot of times women are taken for granted and so we're so happy to be in a time now where women um, and our voices are being elevated um, and so women are um, now being seen as equal partners um, in business and just as capable as men. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Rosa Escareño. I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. Um, and so last year we held a women's event in November um, and we uh, asked a little bit about what we should be doing to continue to support businesses in Chicago, but specifically women. What can we do to ensure that we keep this dialogue going and how do we keep supporting each other? And it was the women, uh, not only through that, that uh, gathering, but as we have continued to work uh, with many of you that said, you know, we don't want the same old sort of listening to a speaker type okay. setup. Um, and so through this series, today we are launching because of Women's History Month, but we are having four of these types of workshops. You told us that you wanted to have a real dialogue, that you wanted to understand and hear from the women that are re operating businesses, and you wanted to further understand how you could connect with them. Building a business is such a difficult task, but it's also probably, for those of the women that are doing it, I'm sure they're gonna tell you, it's the most rewarding experience for those of you who are looking to do that. And so I'm very excited um, about the stories you're gonna hear. Um, you know, in terms of just for you and, and just some advice, I certainly am not a business owner. I run an agency um, here for government. Uh, but in terms of just general uh, tips that I think just in terms of being a woman and being in positions of control and, and power, if that's what you want to call it, is that, you know, use your weaknesses as your strengths. You know, turn your challenges into opportunities. Um, don't compete, because I think competition can actually push, pull you back. And it's really about building that network and figuring out how these women, not just the ones you're going to meet today, but even amongst yourself, how you can continue to support each other and build a strong network for yourself so that you know who to go to. Also, surround yourself with a lot of positive people, positive feedback. Anyone who is not adding to your life, this is something I live by, they are taking away, they are essentially keeping you from growing. And then, you know, don't listen to the naysayers. The people will always say, oh, that's it's a dumb idea, oh, it's not gonna work. And I hear this over and over from just women and business, business owners in general who we, we talk to regularly. So just a couple of stats, you know, women are really growing. Women in the US are, uh, make up about 40% of the business enterprises that are out there. That is a growth from 2017. In 2017, it was about 30%. Just imagine the last couple of years, the increase in women taking control. Um, and so, for those of you, I'm going to uh, hand this over to Kenya Merritt. Mm -hmm. She's our Chief Small Business Officer. She's going to be the uh, moderator here today. But education is key. You guys know that we do these workshops twice a week. Uh, our workshop uh, has have been growing. We have a lot of experts that come to you, talk to you for free. And the last plug for our department that I will do because some of these women have already been on our podcast. The podcast is an extension of our education and outreach program. It's uh, Smart Business Chicago on SoundCloud, download it, and it's 15 minutes talking about these real stories. When you're cleaning your house, when you're walking your dog, listen to them. They continue to inspire you, and you're gonna hear from real business owners. We've had around eight of them, eight podcasts already. No, we're 15. Oh, see, I'm like, okay, <laughs> anyways. I, I'm so excited. Thank you, ladies, and thank you to those of you who are here today, and please keep going forward. So, Kenya, here you go. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Escarino. If we could just give her a round of, of applause for that beautiful introduction. 
So we're gonna go ahead and get started and bring our speakers up. We're gonna start with Dorothy Muzinska. Dorothy is the founder and principal consultant of DM Marketing Group. She's an award-winning marketing strategist and brand strategist with over 15 years of progressively responsible marketing experience and a Kellogg MBA to her name. Her career has been a combination of classical marketing training and large company experience, along with navigating the entrepreneurial environment and working with smaller family-owned and private equity-backed businesses. Let's welcome Dorothy as she comes. Our next panelist is Edith Dela Cruz. There is no separating Edith Dela Cruz from Antigua Construction. For the last 12 years since its founding, Edith's singular focus has been making her company a success. Construction, general contracting to be specific, is a ruthless industry made more difficult by being a minority owned woman firm. So compound it that many times over if you're a woman trying to break into this male industry. Yet that is what Edith is doing. Edith's previous customers are the Illinois Tollway Authority, Chicago Housing Authority, General Services Administration, and Bank of America. Whatever challenges may lay ahead, Edith is confident of the future. And she's done all of this while raising three children. Let's welcome Edith. And I'm gonna start this one by saying James Beard Award Ooh. nominee, Ooh. Stephanie Hart. <laughs> Success has been sweet for Stephanie and her company Brown Sugar Bakery. Stephanie who makes classic Southern desserts and a legendary caramel cake. If you haven't tried it, you most definitely should. She's been featured on the Food Network, Steve Harvey, and expanded her business to three locations. 75th Street, Navy Pier, and on the west side. So wherever you are in Chicago, there's no reason why you can't stop by and pick up a slice of her cake. Let's welcome Stephanie as she comes. So thank you ladies so much for coming out. So let's get started with each of you all sharing your story. How did you get started in with your business, and what was your inspiration? We'll start with you, Stephanie. Okay. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I started my first business in IT in 1986. Did that for 20 years and just wanted to do something a lot more fun, something that I could meet more people in and be more creative. Um, and I also wanted a cake that my grandmother used to make that I could not find anywhere. Mm -hmm. Kind of got good at baking and that turned that into a business. Okay, is that better? Y'all like that? I can talk loud. Some people say I talk too loud. Um, so in 2004, I started Brown Sugar Bakery on 75th Street. And unlike IT, I had total different challenges being in a community versus a corporate environment brought a whole new thing. Mm -hmm. So over the last few years, I've really been learning about that. I'm having a great time being part of a community and growing this business with real people. Last year, we sent out 80 W-2s and I typically wow. hold about 40 employees now. Wow. So um, we've grown, we're, we're at the point now of moving from, I guess you would call it mom and pop, to um, a, a, a corporation that has different uh, opportunities and that kind of thing. So I'm excited to be here. Um, and here you go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. morning. Kenya, thank you so much for the opportunity to um, inviting me to participate in this panel today. Uh, my name is Edith De La Cruz, and I am the CEO of Antigua Construction. Um, I began my company in 09, late um, 90s, and I was also in education. So I was doing kind of multitasking in two different ar arenas, education and construction. And I ended up, I was doing, um, how I started, I was doing, uh, investing in properties in distress. And in 2005, <coughs> I couldn't 
it was it was challenging managing the construction field and I encounter a lot of disrespect towards um, women from you know the industry so I decided you know one day I said to myself why am I fighting with these people when I can start my own and I'm gonna start my own company in construction and I already had like some years of experience and I thought I'm going to start my own business and I'm going to show them how we women do it. Yes. <laughs> so I, um, that was actually my mentality and I began my business. I incorporated in 2005. I'm very proud to say that this year it will be 14 years in April. And I, it has not been an easy road, but I am um, honored to be here today and that I can share my experience with you uh, today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hi to all the women here and the couple of men who are probably lucky to be in this room right now. <laughs> um, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, so I actually, I'm a marketing and branding strategist um, by, by training, by, by education. And I started <clears throat> working in corporate America and I worked in corporate America for about 13 years, the first 13 years of my career. Um, I worked at, in the beginning of my career, I worked at larger companies like Kraft, I'm sure you guys know Kraft, uh, the, the food company, as well as Tootsie Roll Industries, makes all the fun candy in Chicago here. Um, and then towards the more recent years of my career, I worked for two smaller family-owned and also private equity-held businesses. Um, and it was during that time that I realized that there's a lot of smaller businesses in Chicago um, in the food industry, and there's actually about 4,500 food companies in Chicago, if you guys didn't know that it's a huge um, kind of hub for the food and beverage industry. And a lot, lot of those companies are in the small to mid-sized tier. So they're not, the smaller ones are not large enough yet to hire like a head of marketing and you know pay them 200K salary and, and have them be a strategy person on staff. But they're large enough to know that they need help with strategy, right? And so I started my firm to help small to mid-sized businesses with marketing strategy, not from a tactical perspective, but from a strategic perspective, when it comes to brand strategy or innovation strategy or growth strategy. And that's what I've been doing. Um, I started consulting in 2017, and then uh, on January 1st of 2018, I officially launched my business, DM Marketing Group. Um, so that's my story, and thank you so much for listening to us, and happy to be here. So Stephanie, operating a food business in Chicago we understand can have many layers, just as many as your cakes. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about what has the process been like with having multiple locations in Chicago running a food-based business? Well, I think that first of all, if, if we kind of start at the beginning, um, opening a food business in Chicago, you really need to focus completely on what products you're going to have and making those products excellent. Um, I didn't focus much on, you know, who I was going to be selling to as much as making a product that I thought would fit a taste profile sure. and then making it really, really good. And I can honestly say I think that's the best thing I ever did. Like sticking to my guns about the product that I made, not making it what everyone else thought I should make, but really making what I could do the best thing at um, has really carried me um, for 15 years. Um, and then with regard to opening multiple locations, I think that the, the best thing that I've learned about having multiple locations is that you wanna have multiple locations, if you can, that look like they're multiple and you really want to take as much control as you can into one location. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a store at Navy Pier and I have just recently opened on the west side, but we manufacture for all three locations at 75th Street, which gives me a well, one, you can imagine, oh, this doesn't taste the same <laughs> as the one on uh, 75th Street. Well, yeah, it does, because it came from 75th. <laughs> um, so those kinds of eliminating, and then being able, to, quality. 
You mm -hmm. wanna make sure that your quality is exactly the same because customers expect the same thing mm -hmm. um, at every location. So I would say that the two things, if you're going to have multiple locations when you get to that point, mm -hmm. look at how you can consolidate your efforts mm -hmm. and move things around versus moving employees and moving mm -hmm. processes. Mm -hmm. You want to try to keep tight. Mm -hmm. And then definitely starting a food business, I think people don't pay enough attention to the products that they sell. Oh, we're gonna make a salad. Well, I mean, have you really thought about this salad? What kind of lettuce are you gonna sure. use? How often is that lettuce mm -hmm. available? Is it seasonal? What are we gonna put on it? Where are we getting this? I mean, like obsessed mm -hmm. about that, like mm -hmm. really obsessed about it because it's important. That's great, thank you for that. And so Edith, you have managed to be successful again in what is deemed to be a male's industry, construction and general contracting. So what are some of the tips that you can provide to some of the women and entrepreneurs in the room that are interested in going into an industry that's stated it's for men or for males? Well, stay focused. Know your dream. It is your idea, your vision, nobody else's. Stay focused with what you want to do. And um, as the commissioner said earlier, you will receive a lot of negatives. Dismiss them. Focus on the positive. Focus, uh, just focus on the positive. Listen to the positive. Listen to your inner voice because it will guide you. And participate in all of the discussions, you know, the city, the state. I mean, so many agencies, organizations, they put so many classes, uh, programs, uh, seminars, anything that you want so that you can advance. So anything, take, it's like a big puzzle. Take what you, what is going to fit into your puzzle and build it up from there. So you can take one, you know, one, if you can take one item from this class today and another item from another class, put them together, build them up, talk to those that are in the industry. Um, sometimes they said yes, 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 but you know it's like a, a, a it's like a brick wall of yes. Mm -hmm. But when you are in these uh, arenas, participate in the. In, sometimes they are at the table. They have booths. They have tables. Talk to them. Ask them one question. One question that you've been trying to figure it out. How would you, what would you do in this situation? Then you got your answer and it, you put it back into your, kind of your own recipe. Mm -hmm. and, um, and don't settle for crumbs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't settle for crumbs. Go and yes. bake, build your own recipe so you can actually bake your own pie. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yay. Yeah. Right? And so Dorothy, yes. um, you've managed to build a successful marketing firm um, over a short period of time, but you have over 15 years of experience. Tell us what makes your firm different from other marketing firms here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So that's a great question, and, and I think that you know the reason is from a marketing and branding perspective, no matter what business you're launching, right, even if it's a product or a service, or if it's a business to consumer, business to business, you need to have a unique value proposition, right? So the value proposition to the consumer or the customer, right? What is it that you're offering what is what value does your offering give to the customer or the consumer what value are they deriving from your offering whether it's a product service right so and that value has to be unique right it can't be the same as your competitors because if it is why would someone choose you over their over their your competitors so it has to be a unique value proposition i would say that is probably the number one thing in marketing just in general is to have that um, so, so there's a lot of marketing agencies in, mm -hmm. in Chicago, right? And when people think of marketing, what do they think? They think of the tactics, they think of the end use, they think of advertising, they think of social media, website design. Those are all tactics of marketing, that's the execution, right? But it starts with a strategy. 
if you don't have a solid brand strategy and if you have not defined your category, your competition, your customer, your consumer, your unique value proposition, if you haven't defined that, you shouldn't be doing tactics. Mm -hmm. So my firm is different than the other marketing firms because it focuses on the strategy first. Because the strategy is the plan, right? If you don't have a plan, your execution or your tactics will not be very successful, right? So I have a lot of clients, you know, every day calling me, oh, I need a logo for my business. I need a Twitter account. I need help with my website. Okay, what's your brand strategy? Can you answer those mm -hmm. questions? They can't. Mm -hmm. That means they're not ready for tactics, mm -hmm. right? Strategy is first. Plan is first and then execution. Um, so my firm focuses on the strategy and there's not that many firms that do that. Um, and so that's what makes it unique. So the unique value proposition I offer is that I have worked in corporate America for 13 years <coughs> to understand how it works and I'm doing the strategy now for smaller businesses who cannot hire a head of marketing because they're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the biggest takeaway, um, you know, for any, any product or service in, in, the, in the, you know, market in general is you need to have a unique value proposition, right? And we know that 85% of new products fail and it's because they didn't nail that unique value prop and they didn't have a strategy. Yeah. All right, thank you, Dorothy. So we know that starting or launching a business can be really challenging. Um, so let's take it back to when all three of you all started your business. Um, we have many people in the room that are startups that are thinking about launching their business or they're in the very early stages of um, starting their business. And many have concerns or challenges with getting access to capital to seed their business. Can you guys share with us some of the challenges or some of the ways that you've addressed starting your business and um, needing to get access to loans or capital um, or funding to start? Hmm. <laughs> Mine's an easy answer because I'm mm -hmm. not a product business, I'm a service, sure. right? So my startup costs are low. Mm -hmm. I don't have inventory. I don't have cost of goods sold. I needed to form um, my company name and I needed to get a website and kind of general marketing material. So I didn't have a lot of startup costs. I didn't mm -hmm. seek capital. I just used my own um, savings. Um, mm -hmm. But for a product business, I'm um, sure like Stephanie's, there's a lot more startup costs mm -hmm. involved. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Um, I'm going to keep it real. Yes, please um, do. If you're starting a business from the ground up, you may be in a position to get money and you may not be in a position to get money. I was not in a position to get money. So I bled into my business in everything that I had. Mm -hmm. um, I robbed from Peter, killed Paul, brought <laughs> Paul back to life. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, um, it's sort of like you do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that even if you can get money in a business, I'm, I'm gonna say that if you can, in the early stages of your business, not do that. And I'm gonna tell you why. You're gonna make mistakes. If you think you're not gonna make mistakes, you're really wrong. And so even if you put that off for six months until you get an idea of really what you're trying to do, I know so many businesses who have blown so much money thinking that they had it all together, getting out on the block with $250,000, $300,000 loans, and in a year later, that money is gone. Mm -hmm. Because so they have not had any fire yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I am gonna tell you, you do learn from fire, right? Mm -hmm. you, you learn from your gas is turned off and you've gotta get these cakes baked, mm -hmm. and okay. you, you learn from that. So there are definitely you want to have as much planning as you can get done um but you also have to keep it real if you're going to do it look at ways and i'm going to tell you this and and you know some may disagree with me but for my business the money comes from where it's at and i mean that like you definitely have to have thoughts in your head that you're going to get this done no matter what 
And if you let not getting money from a traditional source stop you, you're stopped because mm -hmm. it's that you, mm -hmm. you just are. So mm -hmm. don't let not being able to get funds from traditional sources stop you. You would be surprised. I'm going to tell you this quick story. I was stuck on 75th Street um, in 2008. I had opened up 75th Street in the second location in 2007. And I had started a rehab, got stuck, ran out of money, had to put plastic up. The folks that were going to help me, I was actually going to have a partner that was going to fund that, mm -hmm. pulled out and pulled out believing that that was going to be the end of me. And I just mm -hmm. worked and cried. And when mm -hmm. I tell you I worked and cried, and this is a true mm -hmm. story. So when I say the money comes from where it's at, when you're dedicated and you keep persevering, mm -hmm. things change for you. Mm -hmm. I'm standing at the counter, I'm still cutting all the cake, don't have employees, lots of employees yet. And a lady comes in and she says, these cakes are really beautiful, but I'm vegan and I don't eat cake. And I'm like, well, Soul Vegetarian is right down the street mm -hmm. and they have great products if, if you'd like to mm -hmm. go. She said, are you crying? I said, yes, I am crying. <laughs> yes, I am crying. She said, why? I said, you see all that plastic up here? I need to get it down. She said, what's keeping you? I said, $10,000. She went in her purse and wrote a check right wow. then and there. Right then and there, without another step, handed it to me, and I said to myself, this lady is crazy. <laughs> but I'm crazy enough to take this check to Chase and see if it cashes. I walked into Chase, there was a Chase branch on 83rd and Cottage Grove, had a hard time getting in because they had locks and everything. Got in there, went to the counter, gave them the check. They said, I'm sorry, we don't have money for this. And I walked away and they said, because I thought the lady was crazy, right? Not listening to what they said. Mm -hmm. They said, but they got it on 67th and Stony Island. So that's what I mean. Like wow. little things like that will come to you mm -hmm. when you persevere. Just don't give up. You, you, mm -hmm. If you're really believing in this, mm -hmm. if you can get 25000 30000 mm -hmm. from a micro loan to start, great. But if mm -hmm. you can't, doesn't mean that you, you can't start. So mm -hmm. get started. That's great. So <laughs> my story is pretty much very similar to Stephanie's. Um, I began my company very humble with a big vision. So I had $3,000. I bought a computer, a lap, uh, a computer, a printer, a phone. I rented a small office in Bridgeview and I rented also storage space. And I was already doing business from the rehabs and that, so. And then I believed in knocking on people's, you know, just knocking on opportunities, knocking at the doors. And I said, well, if it works for others, it will work. Mm -hmm. And I had this big vision of, <coughs> to succeed. Now, what was I going to do? Like Stephanie, I, you know, that you do what you do. Sometimes it's true, you go and you ask Peter and then to pay John and John to pay Paul and you know, all of the Southern, every, mm -hmm. so you kind of get by. And, um, and one bit is baby steps. One, know where you are at the moment. And if you don't have and I, you know, if you don't have, I, I like to watch movies. If you don't have a godfather behind you, <laughs> bumping money into your business, then take baby steps. Mm -hmm. Take baby steps. One project will lead you to the other. Always have your financials. Uh, that's one thing. I had an accountant because finan it's, everything is going to be on financials and all of that that they ask for your loan, for loans. But take your time. Don't go and swim into, you know, if you have, if you're one of those people that have easy access to capital to start your business, good for you, but take your time mm -hmm. to assess the situation, to assess what the opportunities, because if you are not selling and you're not, you're spending money, but you're not getting projects, then, you know, that's money that is, is not gonna come back that easy. Mm -hmm. So, um, the way that I did it is basically starting this, 
this project pay for the project and it helped me to increase for another project and I just moved it along mm -hmm. to where I am at right now. Mm -hmm. And I can say that now the opportunities to access to capital are coming in. Mm -hmm. And that's grateful, there's a relief, but sometimes you have to put your own equity from a project that let's say, put your own equity, you get a project, you sell then all of a sudden, though instead of going and spending the money into your new Lexus or your new car, you know, which is <laughs> nice and dandy, but use that money and put it in a, in a CD account or put it in an account so that you mm -hmm. will be able to use that as a collateral to open that small line of business mm -hmm. to get you started, you know, to continue moving mm -hmm. forward and to build your situation where you are at at that moment. So that's, that Thank was my you. experience. Thank you for that. So being an entrepreneur is a journey, right? One that's filled with ups and downs. Talk to us about what is your support system as you go throughout this journey? I'm gonna start with that one. <laughs> so we go and sometimes we don't know what it is. We think of mentorship as being somebody that is going to walk us at like five years old mm -hmm. and help us cross the street mm -hmm. to get us to where we wanna be, mm -hmm. right? Well, that's not gonna happen. Um, you're going, you know, it's, for me, it was very, very challenging. I received a lot of everywhere I encounter because it's a male dominant field and the doors are closed and we understand that. So, but don't take it personal. It's business. Don't take it, you know, I did it, I took it personal and then at one point it was not uh, helpful for me. But I found a friend and you need one person, one person. I that believes in your, in your product, that believes in you, that believes in what you're doing, and is encouraging you, and is moving you forward, and is helping you, and is telling you the truth, not what you wanna hear, but is telling you what you should be doing, or what you should be, or taking another route, and considering other options versus what you think it's right. Mm -hmm. So that's what helped me, it's basically, one person and that you can bounce ideas sure. for advice, sure. assistance. So that's, that's my, um, for me, it was my, uh, my best friend now. So. Oh, yeah. very nice. Dorothy? Sure, I'll go. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think, I think for me it was important to uh, join groups that had other fellow entrepreneurs that were starting out. Um, I can't tell you how much I learned in the first, I want to say, year from fellow entrepreneurs. The advice that I got for free, I mean, it was incredibly humbling, probably the most humbling thing in my whole life. People are willing to help you if you just ask them for help. And people that are in the same situation as you, other fellow business owners, maybe they're a step ahead of you and they've already gone through that process, they will help you. So I joined several groups um, in Chicago for, for entrepreneurs, for people that are starting out. The other thing I did was join groups in the industry, right? So my background is the food and beverage industry. Most of my clients are in the food and beverage industry. So I joined the Chicagoland Food and Beverage Network. Um, I joined Chambers of Commerce. I'm, I'm Polish, so I joined the Polish American Chamber of Commerce. Um, so I think joining groups of people that are um, like-minded helps, and also people that have similar interests helps. Um, I became more involved in my alumni, both from my undergraduate and graduate schools. Um, I think being around other people that kind of understand what you're going through or pe and or people that are in the same industry um, definitely helps. Um, of course, my best friend is you know tired of me calling her every day when I have an issue, <laughs> a crisis or tired of me saying, oh, I get a new client today. Um, but yes, your, your friends are there to help you, but if they're not business owners, they will never get it, right? Like I thought I knew, oh, it's easy to start a business and, and own it and do it. It's not easy, obviously, and it's gonna be a lot harder than you ever imagined. So if you put yourself around other people that have experienced that and they can help you, um, it will help you and it will humble you and it definitely humbled me for sure. Mm -hmm. oh, um, 
I think that what both of these ladies said uh, is very important. Um, goal friends is what I call them now. I have goal friends, mm -hmm. so we get together um, around sharing <coughs> what our issues are and our solutions. I definitely think that stretching out beyond your circle and getting involved in groups yes. that are like-minded mm -hmm. yes. is excellent. Mm -hmm. And your circle is, is beginning beyond your circle can be as far as YouTube on your phone. Mm -hmm. I'm an avid YouTuber. I feed my head voraciously every day. Um, I'm constantly doing different programs. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to read full books, so I use programs like Blinkist to mm -hmm. listen to business books in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. I use an application called Skillshare. Anything I want to know about, I take a seminar on, and every day I'm listening to the mm -hmm. most successful people in the country through um, um, Imagine Network, um, there's Evan Carmichael, there's just tons of information. You can just Google uh, whatever you want to, uh, YouTube, whatever you want to YouTube, and there's going to be all these 15 minute, 20 minute, sometimes 40 minute segments that come up that you can listen to in your car that every morning I wake up. One of the biggest things that I've implemented that I feel really proud about this year for myself that I got from a speaker named Robin Sharman is 202020. So I wake up in the morning, I do not hit the snooze button. You know, Biggie said you can sleep when you're dead, okay? So I do not hit the snooze button. And the first 20 minutes of the day, I exercise. And I'm telling you what I do. I hop out of bed, I click on YouTube, and I do Leslie Somebody's Walking for 20 minutes. Nice. That's it. And then the next 20 minutes, I do something about learning. And then the next 20 minutes, I plan my day. Mm -hmm. So I literally sit for 20 minutes and say, these are the major things I need to get accomplished today. And it helps me so much because when you're an entrepreneur, there are so many fires that are going to come up. Your day will be driven by other people's issues. One other thing I'll suggest, notice I did not say that I check social media or email in the morning because if you do that before you get started with you, then you're already on somebody else's agenda and that's not going to work. And I'd like to um, stay with Stephanie. So late last year, we did a campaign where we were encouraging um, citizens to visit local businesses. So we walked up and down 75th Street and we visited Brown Sugar Bakery as, as well as other businesses that are along the corridor. And I like to call Stephanie a transformative business owner, right? So she doesn't just come to work and stay within her bakery, she actually engages other businesses that are along the corridor. Can you tell us a little bit about why do you do that? Well, I think that it's important, especially if you're in a retail business and you're part of a community that you realize that, I mean, so what we're doing is we're capturing customers, right? So if you think about a shopping mall, Old Orchard, they're going to try to put together stores so that our complimentary so that when you come there there's multiple things mm -hmm. to do so i'm very interested in the the area that i'm in being someplace that people can come we did a, a program with the city um uh, dine shop walk right mm -hmm. and these kinds of things are important because when people come someplace they want to have multiple experiences mm -hmm. so when you come to 75th street you can get barbecue you can get peach cobbler you can get your mm -hmm. clothes cleaned mm -hmm. um, if you're vegan you can go down there's a health food store there's an art gallery and I'm constantly promoting all of that because I want more economic growth in my area it benefits me it benefits the community so it only makes sense and something that um uh, rosa said about competition we think about competition a little bit differently like if a person is going to spend fifty dollars at limbs 
there's still an opportunity for me mm -hmm. because they're over there spending fifty dollars they come spend five dollars with mm -hmm. me right mm -hmm. that's five dollars that i didn't have so the fact what their economy is doing does absolutely affect me and hopefully what i do affects them mm -hmm. so i've coined a word called competitor we're in competition <laughs> so we coexist <coughs> and we co-compete mm -hmm. um, and you just don't have to be competing for the same dollars people mm -hmm. have variety that they're looking for if there was another bakery from across the street they don't do what i do exactly. you know i mean i support other bakers lane's bakery makes great cookies i don't make cookies if you want mm -hmm. a cookie go to Lane's Bakery, and I'm gonna tell you that. If you want a cake that looks like a Louboutin shoe, try um, uh, Penthouse Suites Chicago. I, I'm not making that cake, okay? <laughs> um, and so don't look at it like that, and definitely your community, those that are around you, if you're in retail, you wanna encourage more retail business. <sighs> And so Edith, you are in the construction business and you've been able to leverage contracts with governmental entities to scale and to grow. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you've done that? So for me, it has been um, in practicing. There's all the, paper, all the paperwork responding, being responded to the RFPs going and participating uh, to the site, to the walkthroughs. Mm -hmm. uh, make, but before you go and do all of that, know that there's a contract or something that you can do that is within your capacity, that is within your ability to uh, pursue and put forward. Because you can spend time, and it's, it's a lot of money and time to put this, all this together, but if you don't have the bonding, if you don't have all the pieces to respond to this RFP, it's just not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I think about um, women in power uh, that are in positions of power, that are actually uh, like Jamie Ree, Shannon Andrews, commissioners, all the women that are in those positions, mm -hmm. they are actually breaking and trying to make opportunities for us so we can access the opportunities once we're here. If they can, they can do that all day long, but if we don't respond and we're not ready, it's just not gonna, you know, it's not gonna work. So we have to be respondent, we have to be, uh, we have to be, we have to participate um, and know your industry, really do know your industry, your um, capabilities, and sell, be, you know, like I had a, a mantra say, if they walk and they talk, I'm selling. <laughs> <laughs> so you market your, your company and you yeah. sell yeah. until, you know, it turns, until it's go, it will turn around. Yeah. But you have to participate and be ready. Great. Great. Thank I'll you agree with that. the marketing your company. Yes. Yeah. I'm a little biased, but yes, yeah. yeah, so I'll agree. Yeah. <laughs> So transitioning to marketing, so from Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, podcasts, blogs, social media has become ingrained in what we do every day. Yes, Except yes. now we know from Stephanie that it shouldn't be the first thing that we do when we wake up in the morning, which is great <laughs> advice. So Dorothy, if you could tell us, how can we leverage social media more effectively at the work that we do in, in our business? Mm -hmm. So I think if you ask 10 marketers that question, you're gonna get 10 different answers. Sure. That's just kind of the, it's a very subjective, I think, thing. But I think, um, I think there's two things. You have to separate your personal brand from your professional brand, right? Those are two very different things. Um, and let's maybe separate that further into your personal versus your business accounts, right? So let's say that you are, um, an employee of a company or you're a business owner, you're still gonna have your personal Facebook, right? That's your personal brand. That's not your professional brand. Your professional brand is LinkedIn. LinkedIn for me in my entire career has been absolutely phenomenal. It has helped me so much. If there's one thing you take away from anything I've said today, go update your LinkedIn, okay? Put everything that you've ever done on there, um, everything you're proud of. 
I've gotten business from LinkedIn. I've gotten job offers from LinkedIn. LinkedIn is absolutely number one in profession, whether you're working for a company or starting your own business. LinkedIn is your professional brand, right? You as a person have to have a personal brand for yourself as a professional. So that's kind of on the personal side. If you have a business on the business side, I would say you need a LinkedIn company page just to have it, right? You need to be posting on it. You also need to have a Facebook company page. Um, if you're a visual product like Stephanie's business, you probably need an Instagram page to showcase your products visually. I am a service business, right? I don't have a lot of visuals, so I don't have an Instagram for my business because what am I showing? I don't have a product to show. But if you're a product, you should have an Instagram for your business. Um, but I would say that the biggest thing is keep it separate. Your, your personal life is not your professional life, right? You don't need to be posting about your personal life on LinkedIn, where you went last night for dinner. Nobody cares about that. Put that on Facebook, right? So people kind of, I think, sometimes mix the two and you have to keep them separate. Mm -hmm. um, but I would tell you that LinkedIn for me in my, in my corporate career as well as launching my business in the last two years has been absolutely outstanding and helpful. Um, and I'm very active on it. I post almost every day. Like today I'm gonna post about this event. Um, so wherever I go, wherever I, I go to network or meet other people, I'm constantly posting on, on LinkedIn about that. Um, I think to go along with um, the online networking, the, the in-person networking is also important, right? So continuously networking, keeping people in your life. Don't network when you have to start, when you're looking for a new job or starting a business. Network continuously because when you realize it's time to start networking, it's going to be too late. You need to continuously cultivate your entire professional network on a daily basis. I, I would say that if there's anything you take away, it's LinkedIn and the professional networking. That is absolutely essential to any professional, um, I would say, whether you're employed by a company or whether you have your own business. Final words, single sentence. Best advice that you would give an entrepreneur here today? My best advice would be self-care. Take care of yourself first. Educate yourself, motivate yourself, self-care. Awesome, thank you. Stay focused, stay focused, and stay focused. Awesome. <laughs> um, I would say that um, it's the phrase that my former boss when I worked at Corporate America, the, the CEO of the Evolution Group used to say, we reserve the right to get smarter as we progress, right? Mm -hmm. And Love that it. I think is so essential, whether you're working for a company or starting your own business. Not everything is perfect. Nothing actually is perfect, right? Even though you have a strategy, your strategy is not gonna be perfect. You're gonna need to adjust as you go, and that's okay. So we know that you start, and maybe at 80%, and then as you go, you adjust. So we reserve the right to get smarter as we progress, because as we progress, we learn more, and we have to go back and adjust. Love it. Thank you. Let's give these ladies a round of applause. And so now we have a few moments for questions. Um, my question is for Stephanie. You said you opened up on the west side. What is your location on the west side? <laughs> it's at 4800 West Chicago Avenue, the corner of Cicero and Chicago in the West Side Health Authority building. <coughs> and I have been to get a slice of caramel cake, Yay. so definitely make sure you stop and support. I will be going there. Yes. You're right after this. <laughs> Cicero. <laughs> Ebony? Uh, my question is for Stephanie. Well, I have two. I have two? Sure. Okay. Um, Stephanie, how do you keep your employees from copying your recipes? I'm never concerned about copying me. I'm original. <laughs> Not. I just don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. Of course, as part of the course in onboarding, you sign a not compete clause, but mm -hmm. you can't be me. Exactly. You just cannot because when you become me, I'm something new. Yes, I right. reserve the right mm -hmm. to get that. Yes. So you late by the time you copy. <laughs> Yes. Your competitors. How do you work with your client or your customer in terms of, well, what if I don't know why, you know, like, 
what if you get somebody who says, I don't know why I'm unique, how would you work with them in order to figure when it out? When the customer isn't unique? Or, or your client. If, you're, if you have a client that's coming to you for marketing strategy. Yep. So there's a, marketing is a linear strategic process, right? It starts with, and I mean, I'm not going to go through the, all the steps, but it starts with identifying the four C's, category, competition, customer, consumer, <coughs> and then there's building blocks to how you build your brand, your brand personality, features, essence, values, and you get to the value proposition. It's a step-by-step -step process. So you can't just wake up tomorrow and know your value proposition. You have to go through the process to get there. Um, that's what I help my clients with, but most of them come to me because they don't know what it is. Um, and so I help them kind of go through the steps to get to the value proposition, right? Yeah. We can do another 10 minutes. And for the video, I will repeat the question. So please try and make the question. Um, this is for your, I'm sorry, you said category consumer, what was the point? So there are four C's, right? So if mm -hmm. you take a marketing 101 class, you're gonna learn several things. There are four C's, category, competition, customer, consumer. What category does your business live in? What, who is the competition in that category? Mm -hmm. You don't care about the other competition. You only care about the competition in your category. So Stephanie is a high-end specialty bakery focusing on caramel cakes. The only mm -hmm. competitors that she cares about are the people in that category. Like she said, she doesn't care about the cookie people or the pet shop people or anybody else that's on the street. Only care about the ones in your category. So category, competition, customer, consumer. Who is your customer? Who is your consumer? In some instances, they are the same. In some instances, they're different, right? If, uh, if you know, when I worked at Kraft, I marketed Velveeta, right? The mom is the one buying the Velveeta, but sometimes we have to market to the child. The mom is the customer. The child is the consumer. In some instances, you're going to have to market <coughs> separately to both groups. So category, competition, customer, consumer. That's great. So I have a, a comment first for uh, for Dorothy. I am I work in marketing. Oh, I worked excellent. in food for a very long time. Wow, we're twins. So I love it. I have a resume. I'm going to come here to you. Great. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about how you found those first clients as you were getting started and where you found um, yes that pool of people people to start your business. Yes. Uh, and then I, from all of you, I'd like to know, when did you have that oh crap moment? Like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> I thought I could do this. I had this big dream, big goal, and I don't really know what to do right now. This is, I, I'm kind of fearful. Had a lot of those. Where do, what do I do? So Dorothy, if you could yeah. start by addressing the question of how did you build or how did you start your client mm -hmm. base? And then we'll have the panelists talk about mm -hmm. like their greatest challenge. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I worked in the food and beverage industry in the corporate world for the first 13 years of my career for various companies. And so again, um, to my earlier point, networking is important, right? So at every time I switched companies, I always made sure to keep that network active. And when I launched my consulting business, my first clients came from my, refer my network that I had already established in the corporate world because it was the same industry, right? And so I let everybody know that, you know, I started my firm, this is what's happening, and people started referring to me. And it was because I had already established that credibility as a marketer in the food and beverage industry because that's what I did in the corporate world. Um, but I think keeping your pipeline continuously, you know, active is important for, for a consulting business. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that you're, if, you, if you're starting in a new industry, I, I, I don't have that experience, I wouldn't know how to answer that question, but if it's a similar industry, I think you go to your network for your first uh, customers. That's where my first customers came from. And then if the panel can share, like what was, using your term, your oh crap moment, <laughs> your greatest challenge and how you overcame it. So, in construction is when you, for me, it was um, when I came back, I had uh, from vacation and I had this, you know, starting my year, preparing for the, for the kickoff in, in March. And then all of a sudden my team um, decides to, my, my main guy decides to, t to start his own company 
and take all the workers and when it was the time to do the kickoff meeting, the only one that showed up was me and the, ma and the owner's manager. So I said to myself, so where is everybody else? But, you know, one of the things that for me at that moment was, what do I do? Mm -hmm. um, but if you stay involved in your business as you should, and you know where you are at, you're gonna be able to somehow, you know, at that moment, multitask and find somebody else, and find other groups that they can help you and to get over this hump, right? Because sometimes they just, you, you're doing the right thing, and then they said, well, I can do this. And she would not, like, I think you had that moment of, if I don't help, if I don't do this, she cannot do anything without me because I'm managing this area of the business. So, you know, that's that's the moment that if you're involved in the business and you know where you are at, you you right away are able to jump back and take action to see where you need to fill in that gap. Have your so you know like okay so you're you're the the one but you have a team right yes. so you have your superintendent you have your project manager it's it's a whole team and know your traits know the traits that are going to be and know the critical points so know what is taking what is taking precedence at that moment and be on, and be um, and just be ready have everything you the time to get ready is not like okay so next week we have this this to do it's too late the moment that you have that project you start dissecting the trades you start dissecting you start knowing you start lining up those that are going to take care of the trades those that are going to take care of the things and know that make sure that the project manager and the superintendent are in the same page so that you, um, so that you can take, a they can take action, and also know, uh, follow up also on the back end on the back office support because the documentation is key, the right paperwork, making sure that you have all, that everything in the office is moving smoothly at the same time everything on the field, mm -hmm. and your key people are going to be those that you are having on your team and also making sure that you have the, um, the, all, all the critical points mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is for Edith. Um, I'm an iron worker with the Raiders Union, but my question to you is, do you ever go and reach out to places like Chicago Women in Trade to help a lot of the other young ladies that's there working really hard in the trades that they want to branch off and start their own businesses with any companies? Or I'm an open shop. Okay. So um, being an open shop, I kind of try to stay under the, uh, out of the radar of the closed shop uh, for different purposes. Uh, even though, you know, I, I have been, I have participated, or I have gone to some of the events, um, but we, open shops don't have any issues working, you know, with, um, with any trades, but it's vice versa. There is a big issue, the trades have a big issue working with open shops. So it's, um, so I try to stay you know, a little bit away from it, mm -hmm. and I do uh, base, uh, reach out to people, and I can advise them for a small business, 
for a small company, for someone that is just starting and is taking off. So clothes shop is not the best, you know, sometimes the uh, clothes shop is not the best mod business model for a small business. Mm -hmm. You know, there has, you have, that's why you have to know where you stand because you don't want to get caught in the middle of a situation because you're late in making payments, you're late on, on something, and then they're going to close you. Yeah, they can close you down. So I try to kind of stay at my own space and, um, and maneuver my own, leverage my own. Okay, now that's, that's part of my question. I'm sorry for anybody else on your question. How is it that we can bring something together for the women because just like you're saying I meet a lot of women that have their own business and it's really hard for the women that come out of trade school we go into the trades the trade I'm in I'm the only african-american woman in my trade mm -hmm. um, when I go to work I'm working with probably maybe two three hundred men yes so mm -hmm. I can't be um, lady like all the time I'm in there cursing and screaming and like uh, you mm -hmm. know but I'm like okay if I have my own business I can sure. have a Woo some sure. women, maybe a piece of mind, I'd rather sure. take on different stresses. But when sure. I meet other business women that are not, it's always this battle of that's a closed group, that's a trade, mm -hmm. it's a money issue, it's a political thing, it's this and that. And the women either can't go to the women that already have their business and ask honest questions and get honest help. Where is it or what do we need to do to find a, a come together medium place where someone can ask for help, get help? get questions out without somebody being afraid to, I can't cross that line over there sure. because of this, that, and the other. How can, or do you have any suggestions on how we can find a gap or a come together spot to get something going so more women can actually open their own business and not be afraid to seek help or actually go somewhere and seek help and actually get it, to mm -hmm. actually get it and not get the closed door, oh well, you know, that's not my area. Good luck on finding a person that can help you in that situation. And I think I that's a part of what. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I actually think I'm going to say what you're going to say. Yeah. I think that's what this is that's about. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, just in general, um, there are people that are set up that will talk to you mm -hmm. in general. There is, mm -hmm. and somebody help me because I um, got really good information from them several years ago. Isn't there a retired group where people from different score. industries, score, yeah. thank oh, you. Score, score yeah. might be a really good group yeah. because now these people that were in construction, whether they were open or closed, mm -hmm. they're retired. So they're mm -hmm. just sharing information yeah. with you. Mm -hmm. um, information is out there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the issue of open or close is about doing business currently. Mm -hmm. But information, you mm -hmm. getting information from somebody, it doesn't matter whether you're open or closed. So, yeah, and, just and that's correct. If you are, you know, like in organizations, in, gr in groups, in events like this, you can get your answers. Mm -hmm. um, and if, but if it comes to us going into that school, okay. that's. That, but that's where the difference is. Outside, we can talk, mm -hmm. and if you're, you know, if you're open, mm -hmm. some people are open for discussions, and others are not. So, you know, it's basically uh, part participating in events like this. Mm -hmm. If I could just add one more thing, um, I, I'm not an expert in the trades or construction industry, obviously, but I think a really good organization for women in general is the Women's Business Development Center, mm -hmm. absolutely, which mm -hmm. I know partners with this mm -hmm. uh, office as well. So yep. they do a lot of. Um, workshops for women. I actually spoke there last night on marketing strategy to a group of women who are um, starting their own business. Yeah. So I think that's a really, really good organization for motivation, for support, for help. They have so many programs um, that are that are essentially free of charge, obviously. And I think someone mentioned earlier, yeah. I think it was Stephanie in the beginning, that this city has so many yeah. resources mm -hmm. for business owners, especially yeah. for women. I mean, when I started my business, I came to the classes mm -hmm. here, right? Mm -hmm. That's how I kind of, you know, yeah. got to, get to awesome. know this place. So mm -hmm. um, there's so many resources yeah. out there, and there's also a lot of resources for women in particular, right, which mm -hmm. is great. So take mm -hmm. advantage of that, right? Yeah. Don't be... I mean, get help. Like, yeah. you know, right. like I said earlier, if you ask people for help, they will help you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you know, good as, at heart, right? So, yeah. yeah. I love that you mentioned our workshops. Just a quick plug. We do have workshops on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, and we have our expo that's coming up in March. And we also partner with a lot of the organizations mm -hmm. that were mentioned mm -hmm. here. So if you have questions or if you need a listing of those agencies, be, 
we'd be happy to share that with you afterwards. And so you were like waving your hand about to like do a cartwheel down the middle of the room. You have a question? I have a question. Um, good afternoon. Is it that? Not yet. Okay. Almost. Uh, it feels like because I'm waking up way too early nowadays. But um, I have a windy, I have a rib and whiskey spot in the South Blue. I'm proud to say that I carry Stephanie's cakes for tomorrow. Yes. Um, What's so the name of your business? It's called Windy City Ribs and Whiskey. Okay. I don't eat pork and I'm not a big drinker. So I got into this business and really a lot of the stuff that I'm here today is going to be so helpful for me. Um, Stephanie, you're just a wealth of knowledge. Um, so focusing on the product piece, obviously mm -hmm. that's something that we've got to perfect with the cook that I have. Sure. But the biggest piece that I'm struggling with is um, customer service. And when mm -hmm. I'm not there, because I can't be there mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. I'm struggling with making sure that my employees are a reflection mm -hmm. of the business that I want to be. That's a great question. Can we talk about that a little bit, about when you're not able to be there and you have to have people that are your face of your mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. how do you get to the mm -hmm. point where they're they're able to reflect what you want into your customer. That's an awesome, awesome question. And hard. And hard. Um, I do think, though, that um, your personality, you have to have, like, a mission. Um, mine is life is sweet. It's cake. Mm -hmm. You guys get to smell sugar all day. We need to be happy. Yeah. Folks are not coming here to be unhappy. This mm -hmm. is cake. And so how you work with your employees to present your food, you really need to have something that you stand on around that. Like I said, my stand on is life is sweet. Everybody's here to get high. Mm -hmm. exactly. All right. So, I mean, they are. Sugar is, that's what they're here to do. They're not here to get low. They're here to get high. Um, and then secondly, I will suggest that you become a member of restaurantowner.com. Mm -hmm. And it's a very inexpensive $99 a year. They do constant seminars. One of the things that I do with um, my managers at each location is I YouTube them every week something on customer service that's 15, 20 minutes mm -hmm. long that they can listen to. Mm -hmm. Um, so that you keep up with information and then you're constantly putting it on their heads. That helps a lot. There's no perfect, but the more you talk about it, the more up you are, it kind of rubs off, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's awesome. I have a piggyback question. I'm opening up a small grab-and-go, <coughs> fake-out coffee shop in West Logan Square called mm -hmm. Necessary and Sufficient. And, um, I would am getting ready for the process of hiring, and I'd like to know what your all of you best lessons are for hiring the right employees and retaining those employees. <laughs> for retail, I think that you have some advantages. Um, I think you you want a style. For me, my particular style is I really wanted to go after people that were younger. Mm -hmm enthusiastic and this was something I just chose to do I could have gone another way I could have made the decision to try to hire older people so I think that once you decide what it is you want to reflect in your store what it is you're trying to do I'm trying to work with young women I'm mm -hmm. trying to have them there learning and getting better so that's a main thing for the front part of my store that's something that I choose to do so because of that then I can tie into different programs that have mm -hmm. the particular type of person that I'm looking for. Um, there are programs, uh, Heartland Alliance is one of them. You can get um, employees that um, you know, they spend some time training. Also, depending on what you're going to do, if you can put together a program where you're going to put together something that says, these people are going to have these skills. When I get done with them, there may even be some reimbursement mm -hmm. on the beginning parts of their salary for you. Um, City of Chicago during the summer is definitely a program that yes. I use. That's I awesome. definitely use it. I don't think there's been a summer of recent that I have not used that program um, to hire young people. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that may work for mm -hmm. you. It may not. Mm -hmm. On retention, again, um, I think that what I decided about a year ago is that turnover is going to go down when I become a better leader. Mm -hmm. So I'm working, again, on myself. 
um, so that I'm reflecting and reflective of what it is I'm looking mm -hmm. for. That's awesome. That's great. Know your demographic. Who are you going to be your clients, the area, and then have your, um, your staff fit into the area so that they are walking in into a space where everybody feels welcome and, and warmth and everybody's the same. Um, you know, we're all hipsters or we're all uh, yuppies, whatever they call them, right? So I know the area in Logan Square. And um, so just basically know the, the surroundings and, your and open it up to, the, to your staff so that they also don't have to feel they don't, they don't look that they're not matching the neighborhood. Um, and let them know, you know, it's laid back and, uh, and just talk to them. Uh, know about long-term, short-term, long-term. Where are they in there? And sometimes for coffee shops, students are great because mm -hmm. they have flexibility. Okay, we're gonna take the final questions because I, I see we are um, nearing 11 o'clock, so we're gonna hit you and you. Hi, I'm Teresa, and this is a question for everyone on the panel, whoever can answer it. Um, what advice I'm looking to turn a hobby into a business? I, I know little to nothing about business. <laughs> this is my first time doing anything with business. Um, so what advice do you have <clears throat> for someone who has little to no business um, who is trying to turn a, a hobby into business and um, I won't have probably a shop because I make handcrafted soaps, so I probably won't have a shop um, anytime soon. So you're, gonna, you're imagining selling online or yes. how? markets okay so I think two things so first you said you don't have um, business experience so I would say first of all take your time to educate yourself on all of the okay. business functions um, and so there's so many seminars in Chicago like we already mentioned so many organizations that you know finance 101 marketing 101 mm -hmm. ops 101 right all of the business functions so first I would say educate yourself from a just general business perspective and then I would say the second part is make sure you really have a good marketing plan for your product, right? Again, it starts with the four C's and understanding the brand and the value proposition. Because if you can't articulate that, then you mm -hmm. really can't really start anything. Um, but I think I, I would say take your time and first kind of understanding the business uh, mm -hmm. aspects of, of business in general. Mm -hmm. um, and there's again, there's so many resources in Chicago that, that can help you do that, which is wonderful. Yeah, and our workshops are one of them. So yes. again, yes. Wednesdays and Fridays, we have a whole suite of yes. um, programs and classes that will help you get started. And, so and I'm actually wait, speaking wait, at one of those so if okay. I help myself really quick. in April. <laughs> So really quick, I um, used to host, when I had more space in my store, a women's market. I'm very mm. interested in women and handcrafted items. Um, and so what I would suggest to you, if you are going to participate in markets, it's a great way to get mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. One, I'm going to suggest that you come out and go to the Dixon Market. That's going to be this month at Dixon Elementary School. There'll be all the best vendors that are African American from across the country <coughs> that do all kinds of crafts. They mm -hmm. make clothes, leather goods, soaps, and you can learn so much from them there. Mm -hmm cost your product and get out here because mm -hmm. you're going to have mm -hmm. a great time just really refining while you mm -hmm. get an opportunity to do mm -hmm. business. So by being involved in markets, you're kind of halfway in between being a business and not exactly a hobby anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's a great platform for you to learn from. I know that there's probably a lot of questions, but these women are so busy. They have their businesses mm -hmm. and we still want to uh, be respectful of their time. I want to thank all of you for coming. There's going to be four of these throughout the year, but as Kenya indicated, we have workshops all every week, all year long. So can everybody just help me give them a huge you. So, uh, thank you. You're
I, I don't well. want to leave anything out. I'm looking to Kenya for anything we may yeah, be leaving out. Yeah, I think we have information related to the following three workshops that will be a part of our entire women's series. The next one is Executive to Entrepreneurs that will be in June. For you, we have one in September called Side Hustle Success. And in December, we have our final workshop, which is Level Up. Okay, everybody, podcast. Listen mm -hmm. to our podcast. Follow us on Twitter. We put out all kinds of important, interesting information. Thank you, thank you again. And I thank you guys.